Hi, hello everyone. Well, welcome to the uh, Birds of a Feather session for today. Um, so I'm Fan. I'm a, a, a assistant professor at Duke University. Um, um, so the right the idea of this um, Birds of a Feather session is to open the floor uh, to everyone. Um, I think we have the all the speakers or like most of the speakers uh, for today here. And uh, if you have any questions, just please like unmute yourself and, and ask. And uh, um, well, the topic is the real world crypto, but I think uh, everything uh, we do here is almost all real world crypto. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I see some questions for uh, uh, Dunkrate um, already in the chat. Um, maybe we can start with that. Um, yeah, uh, so, so, uh, Skyheart asked, uh, "What what goes into one polynomial?" Yes. Also, maybe, maybe Dunkard, you can um, explain more on uh, on that. Uh, how what what is uh, what is committed to in this um, um, data availability proofs? Um, right. Uh, so it's um, it's basically whatever data you want uh, to be available. So exa for example, if you wanted to. Um, use the current uh, like ETH1 chain and make it fully um, make a fully fraud proof um, protected last client. Then you would take all the blocks and uh, and um, turn each block into one polynomial and and use that basically. And in ETH2, it's going to be all the shard, uh, shard data. So like each each shard block will be encoded into a polynomial. Um, Cool. There's another question from uh, uh, Freckles. Uh, why, why don't you? Yeah, why don't you unmute yourself and? Uh... Yeah. Um, so the idea is that the KZG commitments are great. Uh, they are a constant, uh, constant size, but they require the trusted setup. Um, so I, I have two questions. First, insofar as there exist other polynomial commitments that trade off the absence of a trusted setup for polynomial uh, complexity. What are the aspects about deploying on Ethereum 2 that made you choose KZG? And second, uh, if there was to be a trusted setup ceremony, when would it leave in the validator's life cycle? Right. Um, so on the first, uh, first one, so um, there are, I, I know of very few alternatives to, to the KCG that, that would be uh, would be similarly small in size. I mean, like basically like everything else would, um, yeah, would, would uh, like, because the sample, like basically we have this random sampling requirement and there's, there's a lot of sampling. So I just like, unless you make the assumption of like some major actor who like gives you the give you gives you aggregated proofs of some form i simply cannot see any other polynomial commitment like for full, uh, fulfilling the succinctness requirements that we have um, the second uh, thing is that um, we also have a very efficient method of computing all the proofs in kzg um, at once like basically in one go using like uh, some Fourier transform tricks um, and I also don't know about any, uh, how that's possible with another commitment. I'm just not aware. Like basically, I, I, as far as I know, like I can't see currently any other polynomial commitment in there. The only alternative that I know of is really um, a zero knowledge proof that proves the correctness of a Merkle root, um, which is currently just not, not quite feasible yet. Um, at least not with a, um, yeah, may, maybe it's just about possible with like a lot of computing power and uh, algebraic hash functions, but we don't quite have the confidence in those yet. Um, trusted setup, um, probably, I, I mean, yeah, we're going, we're going to work backwards. The, the, the good thing is that, um, that it's a very small trusted setup, like um, it is quite small amount of data, like um, the, the degrees are much less than 1 million. Um, so it will be quite easy. Uh, we are thinking about it, but um, currently it's still like a few months in the future, I'd say that we actually 
um, put more concrete plans in place then. Right, yeah, there's another question um, from Burton. Um, sorry if I mispronounce your name, but about uh, what's the verification time in the degree of the polynomial? Is it log? Uh, it's constant. So the verification time is, uh, is simply um, uh, computing uh, two pairings. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's constant, doesn't depend on the degree. And also the proof size is also constant, right? Um, yes, the proof size is also constant. Yes. Correct. Yeah, so there's a follow-up question from uh, Skyhard. Um, um about reorgs um yeah do you want to unmute yourself uh, and, and ask yeah i was just uh, because dunkrod said uh, those transactions are somehow mixed together all, all the transactions in a block for instance uh, in order to produce this uh, these rs encodings and now my question is if one of those transactions is faulty and after a week I, I published the fraud proof, then the reorg happens. What happened or, or what happens now with all those proofs um, that, uh, that happened with the availability proofs that happened in this one week? They, they must be worthless or they, can, they cannot work anymore if I, if I repeat them, try to repeat them. Yeah, can, we clarify, can we clarify the context here? Are you talking specifically about ETH2 or... Um... A light client context or what? Because they yes, it two it two with a light client context, correct? Right. Uh, well, I mean, okay. Uh, so first, in in is two, um, we only have data shards. So for the from the consensus layer, there's no reorg, nothing at all. Like the consensus layer, um, literally doesn't care what you put on those shards. Um, so the interpretation would be left up to rollups. Um, and they can work in two different ways. Like we know two ways of doing them, either the ZK rollups where they can't be fraud because they prove everything was correct. Or um, alternatively, um, you can use um, uh, optimistic rollups um, in which case, um, yes. So that specific optimistic rollup roll -up would have to revert its history if that happened. I mean, one week would be fairly catastrophic. I cannot really imagine that happening in practice. Uh, in practice. Um, however, users would know much before that's included on chain that this is not something they follow. Like users could either follow the full rollup or um, yeah, or, or they can work with um, off-chain fraud proofs and so on. So there are many possibilities. But the, the answer is ETH2 would not be reverted because ETH2 does not know, know any, anything about what the transactions actually mean on those shards. Okay, thank you. So Dunkrad, I have a question that's not directly related to the um, to the to the talk, um, but um, I know there's a, a line of very interesting work on using polynomial commitments to build the vector commitment um, to uh, enable stateless verification. Um, so I wonder if you can tell us more about uh, you know what, where uh, what are you guys working on right now on that front and. Uh, uh, what, what are the you know challenges and uh, are there open questions and so on? Right. Um, yeah. So um, we um, uh, we we are also so until a, a couple of weeks ago, like KZG was also directly in our plans um, to uh, to uh, use as vector commitments um, to commit to the state um, of ECM one. Um, uh, what we want to use is so-called Merkle trees. They're basically Merkle trees, but instead of um, having a hash at each uh, tree node, you have a vector commitment, which basically means you can efficiently um, do much, much wider nodes, whereas like Merkle trees are much, most efficient at width two. Um, vector commitments can go uh, much wider and limit is basically only uh, whether the prover can efficiently compute proofs. Like that's that's uh, that's the main problem with going very wide. Um, so KCG commitments are very good for this. Um, 
Uh, however, uh, the, um, the, the nice thing is that um, you can actually uh, completely amortize the polynomial evaluation. Like for, for each block, you actually only have to evaluate one single um, polynomial. And then the, the huge advantage of KCG comes uh, kind of um, uh, becomes much less important. Um, and so we have now pivoted to um, using pay and commitments and inner product arg arguments instead, um, which are, are somewhat less efficient for evaluating, but it's, it's fine because it can be amortized. Um, yeah, there are, there are many very interesting research questions to answer your question there. Um, I think like the interesting thing is, so basically I think like um, it's now um, uh, basically clear. So the, the problem with any constant size vector commitment um, uh, is that um, that all the proofs have to change on every on every right. Like every time you update any element, all proofs have to change, right? And the the only way you can somehow make that efficient is using tree based commitments because that means you only have to um, update some logarithmic logarithmic number of things. At least as far as I'm aware. Like I basically that's how how I currently see things. Um, but somehow. I mean, worker trees kind of fit the bill, um, but it would still be really nice if you could make something that's kind of more compatible algebraically and um, and uh, kind of allows, I guess the one thing that would be really nice is efficient aggregation of proofs. So worker trees currently don't do that. Um, yeah, so if someone can can come up with new things there, um, there, there is one construction, um, but it has a very high verifier complexity, unfortunately. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, they are, they are definitely interesting problems. And I think like vector commitments are like one of the, the big things that many people are looking into right now. Thanks. Yeah, so if you want to, you know, learn more about the, the latest progress on this front, where, what would be a, what some good resources? Uh, uh, well, on what specifically do you mean? Uh, I think I came across some very helpful um, notes uh, from uh, either Ethereum, not Ethereum research, but some some uh, kind of uh, I think uh, um, HackMD notes or something like that. So I just wonder, is there a, you know a, a gateway to those nodes? Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm making sense, but. Uh, um. Right, I, I I I can't answer that right now. I don't I don't have the I don't exactly know what you're looking for. More for research directions or what's what's the um what's the question here? Do you have a favorite HackMDIO link to get started? I do think it's funny that probably. <laughs> no, the best I mean I don't think anyone has like started. I mean the one thing we have is there was this ETH research post by Vitalik last year, um, where he basically uh, talked about the ideal vector commitment. Um, I can post that. Um... Can I ask a maybe naive question? What's the difference between a polynomial commitment and a vector commitment? Is there one? I mean, I always thought of polynomial commitments as mainly a commitment to the vector forming the coefficients of the polynomial. But I wonder yeah, if so the, dif the, difference, the difference is, so every polynomial commitment is also a vector commitment. Um, because you can just commit to the to the polynomial that evaluates to the values of that vector, right? Um, but uh, but the polynomial commitment, in addition, allows efficient um, evaluation at any point. So, like, I can uh, I can like if you use them, like, okay. So here's a really stupid polynomial commitment. I just commit to all the coefficients in the Merkle tree. If I want to prove an evaluation to you, the only way to do that is to reveal all the coefficients, and then you compute the value of the polynomial. So that's that's like that's a very large amount of data. So good polynomial commitments, efficient polynomial commitments, would basically allow you to do that with much less um, data and computation involved. That hits the spot. Thanks.
thank you. That th thanks for the link. Yeah, the one I think I was talking about is uh, uh, this hack hack MD node. Somebody uh, you know sent me this link, but I had no idea how he uh, came across that. So I was just wondering if there's a <laughs> entry point to that. I guess. Uh, he, he, I mean, this is just how we often. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just an ad hoc idea, so I I don't I, there's no central entry point. I'm sorry. So I uh, I have another question for um for uh, a Sovian, but I'm curious what what you guys all, all think. It seems like like we are seeing um, you know more applications of SGX in the space of uh, blockchain, right? We um. You know, yesterday we, uh, I think Phil talked about um, the applications in uh, MEV extraction and uh, we see uh, mobile coin and, and so on. Um, you know, I'm wondering, so if, if you can give us a, like a sneak peek into your uh, ROM session talk, I mean, you know, what, what are your uh, thinking there? Why, why is in particular, you know, why is, what is, is the, well, what, what changed the, in past few years that uh, kind of make SGX kind of more, more popular? Yeah, just, just one moment, there's some thunder here. I'm going to close the window. <laughs> so I looked like he was getting ready to like race out the door or something. It's like, sorry, massive thunder. And I, I kind of lost what you said. Okay. So. Basically, what I got from your question, but tell me if I'm uh, sort of like um, miss something. Is like my rum session tomorrow. Yeah. So, like I said in the presentation, is that yeah. So there's like kind of a bit of a division, right? Some people are like think like okay, it's basically if I put it very quickly, it's like if you're using Intel GX, you're kind of like uh, you're not a real cypherpunk, say. Okay, it's not because it's against decentralization, whatever. So, but my take on this is that. Trusted hardware, the challenge of trusted hardware is quite interesting. And this rum session tomorrow, I named it like, can we really hide atoms? Meaning is like, I, I kind of find it, and I, I could be way off by the way, but my take on it is that, is it like, um, can we really write into matter? Because a key, a key has to be somewhere, it has to be written somewhere. And the whole security of Intel's GX relies on, on these two root keys that are burnt at manufacturing time. And th this is what we have to trust, actually. We have to trust that when the chip is manufactured, that Intel, which claims that one key, they say, okay, we're safeguarding, and the other key, they say it's randomly generated, and they don't know. But, but it, has, it, it is written at some point in the hardware. It is burnt into these e-fuses. So there are some proposals maybe to improve that, like I think this thing called uh, physical unclonable functions like puffs. But the question comes back still to, can we really do that? Is it really possible like that to write into matter something that you cannot, you don't have, you must not know what you wrote and you must not be able to read it unless under some assumptions like for a specific protocol. It's kind of a bit like more of a high level question and like, but because I don't understand like exactly how this works, but anyways, so this is my thoughts like in terms of it's neither, I'm neither against or for SGX because of that. I just find it an interesting uh, question. Yeah. I also don't know, but would really love to know some answers to these. <clears throat> I got someone to offer an estimate and I think I was like kind of just badgering them to give an estimate until they did. And so I, I don't remember who it was or what the circumstances are, but that like, how expensive would it be to use a lab environment to uh, recover the internal fuses of an SGX chip, for example, in order to read the secret key out of it. Like you can't just do it with a Dremel in like a home basement thing. It's too fragile and the fuses are too small, you, you would need really sensitive equipment in like a sterile lab environment to um, do this kind of like electron microscope scanning uh, action. But someone said, okay, if I had to be forced to give an estimate that it would cost like $200,000, like that's the, the cost of renting 
an advanced lab that would be able to do that. And I don't know where that even, that I have no idea if that estimate's even off by orders of magnitude. Um, yeah, it's kind of tricky. I mean, I like to imagine also that, I mean, it would be great if someone with like, uh, you could build your own semiconductors in a, in a bathtub. You need like some really nasty solvents. Like you probably shouldn't just flush it down the bathtub drain, but it's, it's you know, possible in some sense to do make your own chips. You don't end up with like the state of the art, like, uh, you know, six nanometer production quality chips. You end up with something a lot bulkier and less efficient than that. But kind of um, like the small size of the manufacturing technology seems to relate to how plausible it is that it would be hard to tamper with the chip and read the secret fuses out. So it would be neat if there's some sort of like plausible path where hobbyists could make their own chips and yet convince others that they made them in such a way that they were secure. But I don't know. Has anyone bought up Risk Five yet? Do we talk about Risk Five? I swear to God, someone's been planning on doing a Risk Risk Five version of SGX for like years. I remember this being a topic in 2017. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the uh, what's the name? Keystone. Keystone, right? Yeah, and they have announced a collaboration. I think <clears throat> last January at the the FOSS, the open source an open source conference. I think about. Uh, partnering with Open Titan, which is uh, this open source kind of like silicon on a chip. So, so most of the design is open source, but the, the fab part, like the fabrication is like still kind of closed source. But, and this is, so there's a sort of partnership with Keystone, but I don't know much about it. Like I, when I look, I don't find that much information. And so I have no clue it's not something it's more something that's in the background of my head but andrew what andrew was saying is very interesting because i think there was a it's a chris chris fletcher at uiuc who was telling us this that yeah it's like hundreds of thousands let's say like 100 or 200,000 that if you have the lab the facility for you can definitely do that to recover these keys it's basically like you can uh, you have all these layers of silicon or whatever and you can uh, kind of like slowly remove them and then you can recover the key and he was saying that some labs in the u.s definitely are equipped to do that and to me it is it is a concern i mean if someone is kind of a bit paranoid and but i think this idea that we would be capable to have our own kind of custom hardware is really really interesting uh because why not i mean i mean <laughs> Just like to go on a kind of tangent, right now there's this worry that uh, molecular biology and, and, and tools like for genetic genetics is like becoming available so anyone can buy a kit online or whatever and do certain things. So why not also with, with physical hardware then, um, like with chips, I don't know. But, Yeah, so one, I think one interesting line of, line of work uh, um, is to build the protocols that are, uh, you know, that rely on SGX for some non-critical part, um, but at the same time make SGX failures uh, either, um, you know, uh, conspicuous, either uh, apparent or, or just tolerate SGX failures in some way. Um, yeah, I think those are also interesting uh, directions. It seems like some attacks is kind of, uh, you know, recurring. You, you keep patching it, but, you know, side channel attacks keep coming, keep coming up. Um, but so can anyone say, well, two things here. Like, so, yeah, there's this, like, for instance, this proof of elapsed time was, I think, like, kind of like, I don't know if it's abandoned, but it was realized that the, the incentives for uh, miners is way too strong to hack into their own hardware. And then there was this project by, I think ETH Zurich is part of that. It's called uh, Don't Mine, Wait in Line or something, where they kind of like do exactly what you mentioned. They use SGX just for a portion that it's okay. If it's hacked, it's not a problem. So, and it's basically kind of a gateway mechanism for civil attack prevention. And the, the other point I wanted to say now, I lost my train of thought anyways, but uh, yeah, there's this kind of like, I don't know, because you mentioned something at the end, I, uh, but um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. 
I lost my second point. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's good. So I also wonder, uh, maybe Andrew, uh, we talked about this this at some point. Um, is there a you know a meaningful uh, application in com combining SGX and the MPC, um, you know, to get the kind of the best of both worlds? Is is that is it something we talked about? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there uh, are some interesting uh, ways for this. I know that Ari has some really specific um, uh, thoughts on this as well, uh, as well. I think we're going to have some upcoming project that kind of relates to this. Um, I mean, at a minimum, if you really just wanted the you know safety benefits of both MPC and trusted hardware, it would be straightforward just to run both, like to run MPC within the trusted hardware. I mean, it would probably be expensive. It would be you know, at least slower than MPC, certainly not any faster. Um, and it would be even harder to run than ordinary MPC code because you'd have to write uh, MPC code that runs within SGX enclaves. But then you would have to not only break one enclave, but, you know, a majority of the enclaves that are running for it. So in principle, it's definitely possible. Um, I think the, the game will be, are there ways of kind of leveraging both where you do something kind of more sophisticated than just run generic MPC in an enclave. That'd be a little too uninteresting. And the goal, of course, would be to like, uh, you know, use SGX, for example, to reduce some of the cost of MPC, which usually has a lot of overhead um, in such a way that, there, you know, you could get some, um, you know, benefit there. I think there are some things that are interesting. Like, uh, I really like the sealed glass proofs paper I think that's a good example of a kind of, um, you know, judo where you are leveraging some aspects of SGX. But I think the thing there was like it didn't require, <clears throat> like it wasn't doing something that required privacy on the output of it. So it could tolerate at least a partial compromise of SGX without, um, you know, compromising the desired uh, qualities. Yeah, that's, a, I, I also, um... But the, you know, a pushback on the, that paper, you know, for example, is um, it's really hard to kind of, uh, if you can break SGX, you can not only break confidentiality, you can also break integrity. So yeah. you know, the line seems, uh, yeah, separation seems not big. But, but you know, I agree, that's, I think that's an interesting way of making use of SGX. Another question is, I, I you know, I've uh, written some uh, Rust code. Uh, I've been writing some Rust SGS code recently. I don't know if you run into this issue uh, uh, solving, but uh, it seems to me that the whole uh, Rust SGX SDK ecosystem, including all the ported packages, seems to be a quite fragile kind of a ecosystem, right? It's, you know, you need to kind of port this packages into SGX version and the porting process is kind of non-trivial. Sometimes you change like, you know, quite a lot in the code. And uh, it seems like there's like only a few people doing this for the entire um, ecosystem. I, uh, do you find that uh, nerve wracking? I, I personally think that's a kind of a, not a good way to do stuff. I'm not blaming them, but it yeah. seems like I, I, I think yeah, I think that, that seems to there seems to you know uh, be begging for a better solution. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I can say a few things here because it's just my my sort of like experience. I started working on this stuff like last summer, mostly just trying to help a bit with this uh, safe trace project. Was based on the Rust SGX SDK, and obviously just to get set up, it's not easy. And then at some point, I soon realized in the context of reproducible builds, it's like, oh, this thing, because the Rust SGX SDK is built actually on top of the C++ Linux SGX SDK. And then, yeah, it's a very complicated ecosystem that is not easy to deal with. It's not easy to update new versions. Also, it's not clear to me how the larger, larger ecosystem operates. Because if you look at projects like mobile coin or uh, frameworks like Oaklum, uh, they all rely in some way on some kind of Rust SDK. Mobile coin has its kind of own, I think, spin on it, like a limited subset of it. And Oaklum, I think just 
uses a Rust SGX SDK, but then they all depend on the C++ SDK. And then you have Fortanix, which seems to be totally independent, but I don't understand it enough to have a, an opinion on it. Uh, There's T-Quave so also, kinda, right? T-Quave is like a, yeah. meant to be a, this general platform, like you write some Python code even, and they like interpose all of the system. Like normally with SGX, you can't do like a socket call. There's no socket in, in SGX. Yeah. You have to like emulate it through the unhosted interface. So there they basically like intercept system calls like POSIX, UNIX system calls, and then replace them with their own layer of, you know, enclave emulation of that. Um, but yeah, I don't understand how they, they, it's hard to pin down exactly what the trusted computing base is for that, let alone that the reproducible builds. Did. I forget why exactly we didn't spend more time looking into T-Clave. Maybe it was hard to get to work with reproducible builds. Uh, uh, well, you know, just from a like purely, let's say software engineering standpoint, you have all these layers. So, and it's very difficult, I think, for someone who's new to that and then to, if you want to do something, for instance, in the context of reproducible builds, the base layer has to be reproducible because then the other uh, upper ones depend on it. Um, and it's also, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a complex, a bit challenging ecosystem. And I also would agree with Fan that, especially in the context where you have production systems, I'd say that are uh, depending on it. I don't know if I contrast this with my normal experience with software, non SGX, let's say projects and all that. I find there's like the, the, the amount of things that could go wrong is quite high. Okay. And it's hard to, to know. So you, I think it's important to have a very strong, like robust, like two chains that are easy to reproduce, easy to, to install and set up, easy to upgrade your code. And I think there's some, but I think people are at the same time working on this to improve and all that. So, yeah. Usama, are you up on, on this call? I wonder if you have any thoughts on uh, uh, yeah, these topics. I see your name there, Mohammed S. If he's not answering, maybe I can um, yeah, go for it. And, and, no, and, and fire some. If I would put on my, my thin foil head, okay? And uh, let's say I have a wallet and this uh, a Bitcoin wallet. And this Bitcoin wallet um, is powered by Intel SGX because it's not releasing your keys whatsoever. You know, the, the, the brand is perfect. But um, on the other hand, the concept of dark silicon is not a new concept. It goes back 50 years or so. And we, we know that the trust assumptions, even claimed by, by Intel, is not, uh, is not about the side channel resistance whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I have dark silicon because I know that my, my production process and, and my fab is not perfect. And there's lots of transistors not working correctly. And they are basically dark. But maybe they are not so dark. Maybe they have a purpose. They are the perfect side channel circuitry, including antenna, including everything. I can build everything with dark silicon without anyone noticing. It's impossible to point to a smoking gun if I use dark silicon. So I'm not saying that Intel is doing this or AMD is doing this, but maybe a risk five factory is doing it tomorrow just to prove that, that that's working. And then it, it, uh, the next government uh, switches in and says, hey, that's actually an interesting concept. I want to have it. And uh, you are not, uh, Intel, you're not allowed to talk about it. Here's the, uh, here's the letter I'm sending you from the DOD or whatever, and, and so on. So how do you deal with this missing um, trust into the absence of dark silicon? Can, can you briefly say what, what do you mean by dark silicon? I kind of have an idea, but... To well, sure dark silicon is basically a circuitry that it's not working, you know, that it's basically dead. Yeah. That there's uh -huh. uh, zillions of transistors on, on your processor, even around your FGX uh, compartments and, and your memory and so on, that are basically are sick. They're, they're doing nothing. They're just there. Um, but maybe they have a purpose, but uh, not all the time. 
you know, maybe they're triggered. Maybe they're, there's just a passive antenna to measure something like a side channel and then collect the data and do something else later with it or something like that. There's and It's called dark just because like it's not part of the public spec, like even Keystone is exactly. an open source exactly. design. Maybe yeah. It has, yeah. you know, one million transistors, but now you have this chip that has a million and 10 transistors. What are those extra ones doing that aren't that aren't part of the specification that's kind of like you're yes. given some high level source code in a program binary but how do you know that they match unless you exactly. fabricate yeah. the hardware yeah, yourself? yeah and uh, it perfectly matches with the uh with the uh neglectance of uh acknowledging side channels um and uh, uh, well that's intel is not neglecting it that it's basically saying we are not side channel resistance whatsoever and uh well that says everything i mean this should be a warning sign early on. That's at least my thin foil head assumption for the time being. Well, it makes really a lot of sense. That's kind of like, <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I meant. Like, can we really hide atoms? It's like, the thing is like, well, anyways, uh, but I wonder about this because is this a NSGX specific problem? I mean, just if you mm -hmm. just hardware in general no not at all but uh, yeah. with sgx it comes as a, a surprise because well mm. sgx or let's say in a more general notion hardware security modules they come with a brand with the marketing that says you're not scratching the surface if you try to prove something about me something that something is wrong i just crash uh, and that's uh, just built as purpose you know you you even pay for it you even pay for it because it says uh, well this is a feature that says i'm if you break in i crash and therefore i protect you but now all of a sudden it's impossible to to point to a smoking gun even if you want it you even buy for you buy this feature, but uh, you basically buy your own graveyard, so to speak. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I, I like was a moral hazard or something. Yeah. Yeah, because for instance, right the, there was this guy like Stephen Thomas. He was in the New York Times. He has this crypto hardware wallet in which he has like seven seven thousand bitcoins or so, and he forgot the password and he has 10 attempts and he has used eight of them and he was featured in the new york times and it's like it's dramatic situation you know anyways the point though is that here that's a bit similar right if you try to break into it you kind of will destroy whatever is in in it but with sgx you don't have this because it says no no it's okay you can be sitting on the host system you can be at the operating system level even with privileges uh, with user privileges, but this enclave is protected. Is that what you kind of like trying to say? Well, I, I see it more similar to hardware security modules and I see a moral hazard of the, um, the fabricators of these modules. And uh, uh, if they are on the side of their customers or not on their side, you, you know, you, you never know, basically you have to, to, um, you, well, to expand your trust model accordingly, you basically you basically uh, replace inside in hardware. So, in, uh, well, in terms of um, reproducibility, for instance, you replace that by trust in the manufacturer and in the jurisdictional system of that manufacturer, basically. Yeah. So, do you think we could have like DAOs, like decentralized? manufacturing organizations i don't know how this would look alike in a physical setting i have to say but <laughs> i agree with you because as long as we rely on like a central entity to man manufacture something and with something like that is so complex mm. anyways it's a uh, you know you could imagine having uh, maybe if not for full featured things then at least for um smaller uh you know components like kind of tpms is like the original Kind of phrase for te like things that generally connotes like less than the full functionality of you know intel chips which are like the entire x86 basically um, but you could imagine having like a hardware component that has like a chain of several different tpms each of which has to sign off on something uh, but were all made by different manufacturers 
um, then at least like to get something wrong would have to go through all of them yes. rather than the weakest yes. link. Yes, yes. If these manufacturers are not belong to one entity um, uh, on the on the capital base, for instance, or one jurisdiction, it could work out. I, I agree with this. So so such a counterbalance, so to speak, you know, checks and balances in the hardware industry. This could some be some solution to this problem. I agree. But I don't see that nowhere at all. The, the risk five um, and you know the foundation or whatever is you don't think that make uh, you know an improvement over there yeah open hardware is a nice idea i have to say i'm a, I'm a fan of open hardware but um, i'm hesitant to believe in this silver bullet so to speak because um, an, an industry can be played as well. You know, even a standardization body can be played, as we know, with the NIST, for instance. Uh, so it depends. It, <laughs> it depends on the circumstances. Um, yeah, there's nothing more to say to that, I assume. Oh, I see Ratley uh, joined us. Um... It, uh, sorry, I didn't see your message earlier. Um, yeah, no I worries. actually have, have a yeah. question uh, about the Winterfell. Uh, maybe um, I'm wondering. You know, um, you 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 showed us how to write these applications in in Rust, but it seems that you still um, need to kind of hand optimize your constraints. Um, kind of, you know, if you do it very inefficiently, um, you, you could end up with inefficient uh, constraints. Kind of, if you don't, if you're not careful. So I wonder if you know, you know, you have a, you have plans for uh, building compilers or leverage other compilers to do that automatically. I'm not sure if that's, um, yeah, if that's you know possible. Yeah. So there are. I think um, you uh, pointed to a very interesting problem because yes, you need to understand how to do this arithmetizations and not only is it difficult to do it um, kind of like uh, uh, in optimal way, but you can also potentially make mistakes somewhere um, and you know not capture all the constraints that you need to capture and then potentially whatever you describe may have an issue like security vulnerability of some sort. So um, it is, it, it is uh, uh, definitely something that is an issue and it would be nice to have a simpler way to uh, kind of uh, write your programs uh, so that you can generate you know, this proof of computational integrity for them. I think in general, there are two broad approaches of how can, that can be done. One is the compilers, uh, like basically take some higher level language and like run it through a compiler and generate this uh, you know, uh, set of constraints. Um, and uh, as far as I know, um, nobody is working on this uh, compilers right now because I think it's probably, uh, well, not probably, but it's for sure a fairly complicated challenge. I think it's like an order of magnitude more complicated than writing a compiler for a regular language. So to come up with a, you know, take a general uh, program, general purpose program, and then reduce it to a set of constraints in an optimal way and the correct way and all of that stuff. Um, the other approach is to create a virtual machine um, where you have a single set of constraints that define some virtual machine and then your program, you know, you know, you write a regular program and that executes against that virtual machine. So like you need to define the, uh, this constraints only once and you can spend a lot of time optimizing them and making sure that they're correct um, and all of that stuff. And then everybody else who wants to use it just writes some code against the virtual machine and then you can have, you know, use all the tooling that is available, uh, you know, with some tweaks and modifications to compile from some higher lang uh, level language to the machine of this, to the language of this virtual machine. And this is, seems to be the approach that is being taken by Starkware, and I've also worked in that direction. I think, um, um, you know, it has a number of uh, kind of attractive features to it versus the compiler approach. Um, I think in theory, you can say compiler can be more efficient in the way that it optimizes things for a specific computation. Uh, although, uh, you know, I think a lot needs to be invested into uh, building such a compiler that can actually be more efficient than a virtual machine approach.
I don't know if that answered your question or if I missed something. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. So say if I want to, you know, start, um, you know, I, I for example, I have a project needing a zero knowledge proof component. Which, you know, where should I, uh, where should I start? What's the uh, what's the you know easy way to get started? I think, I mean, it, it really depends on your use case. So like, for example, if you do uh, for, for, you know, evaluate your use case and say that, um, you know, I, I want to go with Starks, right? That's one approach. If you want to go with like a snark based approach, which is, uh, you know, there exist some compilers out there for the other uh, types of proving systems that you can take a program and, you know, um, we're still with not it's not easy, but, uh, you know, you can write your circuits uh, like in Circum or some other languages that are, Still, I think not super easy to program in, but it's much easier than I think trying to write the constraints by head by hand for air. Uh, so you can start with that kind of world, depending if you're uh, fine with like the proving systems that use R1 CS, it might be a bit easier to do this by hand. You can start with directly writing air, but it really, the things that you want to generate proofs for are fairly complicated. Like if it's not, you know, relatively simple computation, then I think, uh, it will take you quite a bit of time, uh, or you need to expect that it will take you quite a bit of time to come up with a set of constraints that uh, are optimal, you know, perform well, maybe not optimal, but perform well and are secure and things like that. But, you know, it can be, I would say anything, if it's like, and it's in a kind of ambiguous term, but like a moderately complex computation, you probably don't want to attempt writing things by hand. Uh, so, uh, um, that leaves kind of the only option is to try to use like a virtual machine that somebody else built. So Starkware has a virtual machine out there, which uh, you know uh, uh, you could use. Uh, I think even today to generate proofs. Uh, I worked on some virtual on a virtual machine uh, in the past myself. Uh, it's not a production grade virtual machine, but for you know some purposes it may suffice. Um, but basically, that's um, um, that's these are the options that you have. You can go with like some higher level languages that exist out there in R one CS world, and I think Circum is one of them. I think there is a bunch of others. Uh, I can you know uh, find and post links in the chat here, but there is a few others that are very promising. And then on the Stark side, um, if you want to use Starks, you can. You're probably better off unless it's a very simple computation using like a virtual machine like Starkwares or you know uh, some other things that uh, are available out there. Maybe a naive question. Um, can you translate between R1 CS and AIR constraints? Um, it should be fairly easy to go from AIR to R1 CS. Um, going the other way might be more difficult or would be more difficult because um, AIR or AIR, as I call it, it basically describes uh, a structured computation. So an R1 CS could potentially describe an you know, arbitrary and structured circuit. Uh, so uh, whatever tool that translates R1CS into AR should be able to detect the structure in, uh, in that uh, kind of circuit and be able to extract the structure, which I think is a very you know, highly non-trivial task. <laughs> Yeah, I think that there's somebody posted uh, a link. Uh, I think there was a talk about different, uh, you know, snark based languages and compilers. So uh, I think that probably covers uh, a lot of it in terms of what exists out there. Is this, is this, uh, I, I posted that, but I know very, very little about this. And, but uh, it, it looked interesting to me. Is this sort of attempt to unify, to have a kind of unified compiler for many different, I think at a higher level, and was I I know very little about it, and it was a little while that I I, I came across this. Uh, it could even be used for some even MPC circuits, perhaps. Um, it just looked interesting to me. They have this concept of, I think, quantified existential circuit, or I forgot the name, but yeah. Yeah, I, to be honest, I myself am not super familiar with this specific one, but there are a few ones out there that are trying to unify kind of the way you create uh, right circuits for zero knowledge proofs. And, you know, some of them uh, target specific systems, some of them try to be, you know, uh, general enough to be able to, to be applicable across different systems. I'll, you know, once I stop speaking, I'll find a few links and post it back here as well. Okay, cool. Thanks.
Another thing I'm curious is why um, it seems like all these projects are written in Rust. Um, yeah, I personally, I think I, I also like Rust um, at the, the, uh, the guarantee provided by Rust, but uh, it's not a, a particularly easy to learn language. Um, if you, you know, um, writing those air, uh, even the demo you did is kind of non trivially involve some kind of advanced Rust features, right? Um, yeah, so I think, um, I mean, it seems to me that a lot of, uh, for one reason or the other, and I can't really trace and say why that happened that way, but a lot of the crypto projects, and especially the ones that have to do with zero knowledge proofs are using Rust. So it, uh, uh, I, there are a few that are not, uh, but I think like if I had to think about like the, the things that I know, a lot of them do use Rust, like a, probably a bigger portion of them than, you know, I can cite more projects in zero knowledge proof space that use Rust than the, the ones that do not. Um, I'm not sure like how that happened and why, but it seems like it's becoming, uh, uh, I don't want to say a standard, but like a very accepted and normal thing to, to use Rust for this type of thing. So, uh, but you're right, absolutely. Like this, uh, you know, when I started with Rust, it probably took me several months to get to a point where I was fighting the compiler less than I was actually thinking about the logic. So <laughs> it would take as much time to fight with the compiler. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Tyler but, can tell us more. <laughs> but I, I think in terms of advantages, like I do like it's like super performant and it's now that I've gotten used to it, it's very easy to write like, um, you know, I mentioned zero cost abstractions where you can write a very modular code, which is still very performant. You don't start, like, I'm sure it's possible to do it in many other languages or at least some other languages, but maybe not with as much ease as it is uh, with Rust where once you understand how it works, you can make it uh, make use of the features that, uh, do not like allow you not to sacrifice performance in the same uh, uh, time, have a very uh, modular and uh, you know, easily maintainable uh, project. <laughs> since, uh, since Fan has baited me, um, I will completely go off topic and not talk about Rust. Um, I was gonna ask you, so I, I have some experience with JSNARC, um, writing um, ZK Snarks using that particular library. I'm sure there are others for writing R1CS kind of things. Um, when you were showing your presentation today, um, it looked a little bit lower level, like in terms of like logic than the kind of stuff that you would write in JSNARC where you can like basically write like almost like a normal program, right? Like a hello world kind of like, um, is it possible at this time to like do that kind of thing with Starks or like is the ecosystem not there yet or is the ecosystem still like you have to pay the Stark company some kind of money in order to be able to do that? I know you mentioned VMs earlier. Yeah, so uh, in terms of the compile, like basically I know what you're talking about. So basically um, right now in Winterfell specifically, you need to, it's a very low level library, I would say, uh, where you don't write the regular code, you actually write the constraints. You use Rust to write those constraints, but you still need to write the constraints by hand. And there is no compilation that happens. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of uh, libraries out there that uh, uh, help you do that. With Starks, um, you know, I myself worked on a language that would allow you to do something like that. It's called AirScript and there is also AirAssembly, uh, but um, you know, uh, I worked on that a while back and um, they're not as powerful, like they're, they're very limiting in what they allow you to do. And in part uh, is because um, it's very difficult to make uh, kind of uh, start based programs or like not programs, uh, but uh, kind of definitions of the program com uh, programs composable um, because of this like a very specific way that you describe the structure repeating structure of different, you know, uh, computation that happens within the start. You know, if you write something for a hash function and then, uh, you know, we want to use a hash function in a, in a in another circuit, it's not trivial how you combine the two computations together to uh, still retain the same kind of like optimized properties and all that stuff. So uh, as far as I know, for Starks, there is, again, no simple way to write uh, things except for use a virtual machine. And of, uh, um, because in that case, you don't actually need to know anything about the constraint system or maybe very little. Um, there, are, uh, there are no tools out there. And again, I tried to build one of those tools and then my eventual conclusion was that it was gonna be too hard to build like a language that would compile into, um, into kind of like a start-based format for, into air. And it's easier to build a virtual machine that has like 
predefined set of errors and then can execute the general uh, you know, programs, any kind of Turing complete program. So it seemed like at least for Starks, the, the shift has happened toward the virtual machines rather than compilers. So you, you would write these kinds of things in, in assembly. It's almost like when we think about things like the Ethereum virtual machine, where you have like this sort of virtual machine running on, in its own environment on top of a normal CPU and okay. I see you're nodding. Okay. Yeah. So it's basically like a, a virtual machine with some a set of instructions. It could be like low level assembly. It could be slightly higher where you can have like if statements and things like that, and maybe like a slightly higher than just a low level. But the idea is that as you execute this program on this virtual machine, you automatically get a proof, a start proof that the, this program was executed correctly. Um, so you don't really need to do anything extra. You write regular assembly code, or you know you can come up with a higher level language that will compile into this regular assembly code, and then um, you at that point by the time the execution of the program is done you also have a proof that the program was executed correctly is is there a new software available that can can do this already um yeah so like uh, uh, the one that is commercially available and like production grade is uh, starkware's um uh, cairo i think uh, there is a talk by Ellie tomorrow. I'm sure he is going to mention it tomorrow in his uh, in his talk. Um, and then there is like the, the research project that I've done, and I'll post it uh, in, in here as well. That is kind of like a you know uh, more kind of uh, again research grade uh, virtual machine uh, that also has a kind of assembly uh, uh, its own assembly that you can work with, um, and it works fine. But again, it's not the same like in terms of performance and like you know the amount of rigor that went to verifying that everything works correctly. Yeah. Cool, but I'll post the link here if you guys are interested, um, both to Cairo and to uh, the stuff that I was working on before. Yeah, please. And uh, basically in terms of like Winterfell, so like the idea of Winterfell is that you can actually use it to write like a, a virtual machine, for example, it's low level enough where you can implement your own virtual machine uh, using Winterfell, for example. This is, uh, and this is Cairo, which is uh, here. I apologize if this is a stupid question, but how big is the community around Winterfell, for example? Like how, how many different groups are working on it and stuff like that? So we developed it at Novi. We just released it basically a month ago. It became went open source a month ago. So not huge at this point in time. I don't think um, it's that big yet. But uh, you know, hopefully it will grow. Again, we haven't even published the version uh, 0 0.1 version to create IO yet. We're hoping to do it fairly soon. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Novi's interest in the zero knowledge proof? Um, yeah, um, applications. I mean, um, I think you you guys know that Novi is kind of working on the uh, uh, DM blockchain and things like that, right? So um, there is a, a lot of interest in terms of like how we can apply zero knowledge proofs to like typical you know blockchain problems that you have, like privacy, scalability, and you know things like that. Um, I would say, you know, there is a lot of research going into this, but I think uh, in terms of the maturity, it will probably take a little bit of time before this can be deployed in production. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm trying to find some other links in parallel to different um, um, languages that are available. So I think I listed Circom and I listed the start based virtual machines. Um, and I have a couple others that uh, I can list here as well. Just will take me a few moments. But it is like, I think if I think about zero knowledge proofs uh, or, or proofs of computational integrity in general, I do think there are two big problems uh, overall. And the one problem is um, how do you make it easy for other people to use so that they don't need to learn and like everything. 
Uh, and the other one is, uh, you know, how do you make it fast enough so that you can use, uh, you know, regular cryptography in, you know, inside the circuit so that it doesn't take you minutes uh, or hours to generate proofs. I mean, for, there, there are very efficient ways um, to speed up computations and even general computations can be sped up fairly well, but there are still limitations on, you know, you need a significant hardware, for example, to um, generate those proofs. And, you know, they're not costly. So like uh, I, we run some uh, benchmarks on, uh, let's say Azure, uh, you know, the proofs cost less, but less than a few cents, but it still like takes uh, uh, a machine with 64 cores and like 200 gigs of RAM to generate some of the larger proofs. <laughs> Yeah, it's very amazing to you know in the past few years to see all these uh, zk um, protocols to be you know not only devised uh, and but also developed and potentially deployed that's i think a really amazing uh, industry so i think we are probably at the top of hour. um is that right 2 30 yeah 3 30. um uh, yes yes yeah. so thanks everyone for participating and fan for leading the birds of a feather session today